Hello, this presentation deals with the classification of things. In the previous narration, we identified when an object would qualify as a thing. So we know then when objects would qualify as things. What we now need to establish is the type of thing that we are dealing with. Once we've established that something is indeed a thing. Now the classification of things is, is important because how a thing is classified can determine the choice of rules or principles as regard the acquisition, protection and enforcement of rights in or over things. With that said, we can classify things according to two measures. So a thing can generally, generally be classified according to its either its role in commas, in other words, its negotiability, or its nature. We will be focusing on its negotiability or its role in commas first, and then we'll move on to look at um, classification according to nature of things. So the important question with regard to the role that the thing plays in the commerce or its negotiability is whether the thing can be privately owned or not. And when we get to um, the slide on which I have put a diagram, you will see how we distinguish between privately owned and um, uh, things that can't be privately owned. In other words, things that's in the public sphere. And then we'll talk a little bit about that more. But I think it's important to know that classification according to negotiability is based on the Roman classification method. You'll also note that when we get to the diagram, there's a lot of Latin words that are used. And this is purely because um, the, our foundational classification according to negotiability is based on the Roman classification method. So as I've already mentioned, is the primary distinction that is drawn when we classify things according, according to their negotiability is basically, first of all, is the thing a, nego a negotiable thing? In other words, is it susceptible to private ownership? So if it is susceptible to private ownership, you say that it is a negotiable thing. Or is it a non-negotiable thing? In other words, it is not susceptible to private ownership because it is, it falls within the public sphere. So if something falls within the public sphere and it cannot be, ownership cannot be acquired over it, you will note that it is a non-negotiable thing. And this is really the first distinction that you draw when you classify something according to its their negotiability. But in the next slide, we'll look at the further sub um, categories that we, we have under negotiability and also under non-negotiability for further classification um, of things. So what you have on your screen is the diagram that I spoke about earlier and your starting point is um, the term res. So what does res refer to? So the, the word res refers to, um, and that's your starting point there, refers as always another word for thing. Um, it's the Latin word for thing. So as you can see, we distinguish on the first um, level between res in commercio and res extra commercio. So res in commercio um, refers to the, your negotiable things, so things in commas, whereas res extra commercio refers to things outside of commas. So the further subcategory for res in commercio, in other words, things in commas, a division can be drawn between things that are currently owned, which is res alicius, and things that are not currently owned, which is res nullius. Now, when we talk about res alicius, in other words, things currently owned, um, that can further be divided into um, further subcategories. So things which are currently owned may be owned by individuals. There we have res singularum and or 
corporate bodies, res universitatis. So things that are owned by individuals are referred to res singularum, whereas things owned by um, corporate bodies are referred to as res universitatis. For example, um, if you have a house that is in an individual's name, so for instance, the house that is in your mother's name, um, your mother is the private owner of that thing, the house, then the, the house would be classified as a res singularum because it is in private ownership, specifically um, owned by a single person. But then a corporate body, something that belongs to a corporate body can, for instance, be houses owned by the University of Pretoria. University of Pretoria is a corporate body and um, the houses that it is that is in its name is then res in OK, so let's then move back to this uh, sub sub uh, division or distinction between res aliquius and res nullius. Now that we know what res aliquius entails, let's look at what res nullius entails. So res nullius, just to recap, really refers to um, things that are not currently owned. Now, an important word about this is it can be that the thing was never owned or has never been owned and is owned by no one. Okay, um, And this is where we then draw the distinction between res derelicta and res nullius proper. So res nullius proper is the one that refers to things that have never ever been owned by anyone. Um, the thing um, has been ownerless in the past it's, uh, it's, and it's also ownerless currently. Whereas with res derelicti, we're referring to things that perhaps have been owned or under the ownership of someone um, previously, but then were subsequently abandoned. So now at least um, it is a res nullius in the sense that it doesn't have an owner. All right. So this is then the um, res in commercium um, category or for the classification of things. So things that are in commas, this is how you will classify it and these are the terms that you will use. So let's then move over to um, res extra commercium, which refers to things outside of commas. A division is drawn between res omnium communes, which is there, res publicae, and then res divini juris. Now, res omnium communes refers to things that are common to all, for example, the sea, the air we breathe, and running water. The second type of thing that falls outside of commas is res publicae, and it which basically refers to public things like public roads, rivers, and harbors. And then we have res divini juris, which um, refers to religious things. For example, graves, graveyards, and tombstones. All right, so what is then the significance of this um, classification diagram, specifically when you need to classify something according to um, its negotiability? It gives you a specific description of the thing that will then impact ultimately um, how the thing can be acquired, um, how rights over or in the thing is protected, and then also how rights in or over the thing can be enforced. Um, for example, res universitatis, rights uh, or things that are res universitatis versus um, res derelicti or res publicae um, are regulated uh, differently in, in the law of things. So it is important to then know what type of thing you are dealing with to understand how it can be acquired, how your rights in it can be protected, as well as how you can enforce your rights over the thing. All right. OK, so let's now turn to the second classification method, or, which is um, classifying things according to their nature. Now, things can be classified uh, according to the following subcategories of the nature. Um, so basically, descript is what describes the thing best. Um, so we have uh, 
corporeal and incorporeal, we have single things and composite things, we have divisible things and indivisible things, we have movable things and immovable things, consumable things and non-consumable th consumable things, as well as fungible and non-fungible things. Now, and we will quickly um, discuss or unpack all of these um, descriptors or uh, descriptors that describes the nature of things um, during this specific narration. So let's then start with um, corporeal versus incorporeal things. Now, incorporeal things, we've already looked at what incorporeality entails and what would not be incorporeality. In other words, then what would constitute um, a corporeal things. So just to recap, because we've done this under um, the characteristics of a thing. So just to recap, corporeal things, um, another word for corporeal things are tangible things. And when we say tangible things, we actually then um, already have the definition of what a corporeal thing or an idea of what a corporeal thing should should and uh, should be. So tangible things can be appreciated with the senses. So if you can appreciate this ob the object with your senses, it would mean that it can be classified as corporeal, but it will also have to take up space. So that's a twofold a test for corporeality. It must be appreciated with the senses and it must also take up space. Whereas incorporeal things does not have this quality where it, uh, that, that it can be appreciated with the senses and it also does not take up space. So incorporeal things are also known as intangible things, and they really refer to abstract, it's an abstract concept with no physical existence, um, but that has use and value. And when we say abstract concept with no physical existence, we're really referring to the fact that it is, it's, 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 it's not corporeal, it cannot be appreciated with the senses, and it doesn't take up space, but it does have use and value. Things can also be classified according to whether or not um, they are movable or immovable. Okay, so when we 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 then have to distinguish between movable and and immovable things. So how do we determine um, when something is movable versus when it is immovable? The, there's a specific test that we'll have to apply, and this test is or the question that needs to be asked um, is, can the thing be moved without causing damage? Now, if it can be moved without causing damage, then um, it is movable. But if it cannot be moved without causing damage, then it is an immovable thing. So what about land then? If we apply this test to land, can land be moved without causing damage? No, it would be very difficult to move land and therefore land would constitute um, an immovable thing. It's something that cannot be moved. What about permanent attachments? Are they seen as movable or immovable things? A permanent attachment, for instance, would be something like a house that is built on land. Permanent attachments cannot be moved without causing damage and therefore they would constitute immovable things. Think about documents on a computer. Would you say that um, if you apply this test, it, it's movable or immovable? Take a moment and think about that. So things can also be classified uh, according to the nature based on whether or not they are singular or composite. So to know then when something would qualify as a single thing or as a composite thing, one first has to understand what these terms mean. All right, so single things refer to things that are individual, that exists independently, and that comprises an entity that has use and value. And it can ordinarily also be grouped. In the next slide, we'll look at what is meant with composite things. So in the previous slide, we've indicated what single things are. And single things are individual things that exist independently and comprises an entity that has use and value and that can be grouped. Um, and what we should note that as point of departure is that 
composite things do not have these characteristics that things, single things have. So the moment something is an individual thing that can be grouped, that has its independent existence, and that comprises an entity, a single entity that has use and value, if it has all of those characteristics, you should know that it isn't a composite thing. So what is a composite thing then? Well, a composite thing, um, although it perhaps doesn't have um, the characteristics of a single thing physically, it is regarded as being a single legal entity in law. So the, it's, it has legal um, singularity, but not physical. Phys it doesn't have that um, quality physically. And composite things comprises of a principal thing, an accessory thing, and then also an auxiliary thing. Now, the principal thing ordinarily refers to the thing that um, is the main part of, of the composite um, object. The accessory thing is normally the thing that acceded to the, the principal thing, that attached to the principal thing and then became part of the principal thing. And the auxiliary thing refers to some, uh, ordinarily refers to something that um, goes with the, the, the principal and accessory thing, although it doesn't need to be physically attached to the principal and ex ex accessory thing. And together, um, they then form this composite thing. Okay, but these sort of definitions or descriptions that I just gave are really um, abbreviated and does not constitute the full descriptions. We will look at the definition of principal thing, accessory thing and auxiliary thing in detail in the next slides. All right, so our focus is now again on the composite thing, but specifically the definition of a principal thing and how we uh, define a principal thing is really drawn from the distinction between principal things and accessory things. Um, and we have this de the definition of how to distinguish be to between, or the, sorry, we have the definition of a principal thing um, in the Khan versus Minister of Law and Order case. So the, in the Khan versus Minister of Law and Order case, the court laid down the definition for principal things. Um, and the court said that one must view the thing that was ultimately formed and decide what is the identity of that thing. So when all the, the parts come together, one must view the thing that was ultimately formed and decide what is the identity of that thing. And the component that gives the ultimate thing its identity will constitute or will be the principal thing, while the others will have acceded to the principal thing to form the, uh, the composite thing. In other words, the accessory thing is a thing that has no independent existence while the union lasts, but might have had an independent existence before. So the principal thing is then the thing that gives the um, composite thing its identity. The other part that exceeded, in other words, that attached to this um, principal thing would then be described as the accessory thing. All right, so in the previous slide, we looked at the definition of the principal thing, which was laid down in the Khan case. It said that it's the component that gives the composite thing its identity. That is that part is the part that we call the principal thing. And then anything that it, all the other parts then are accepted to have acceded to that principal um, thing to form the composite thing. And those parts that were exceed or that exceeded or attached to the principal thing are, are, are called the accessory thing. All right. Um, but I've also indicated initially or in the, in the first few slides that there are we have principal, we have the principal thing, we have accessory thing and we have auxiliary things in the um, in, in a composite thing. So how then do we distinguish between what an accessory thing is versus what an auxiliary thing is? 
So an accessory thing had an independent existence prior to attaching to the principal thing. So it, it attached to the principal thing in such a way that the accessory thing lost its independent existence and also its, its independent identity. Um, and ordinarily or generally, this attachment would be physical attachment to the principal thing, which means that if it is removed, damage will be caused. Damage will be caused to um, the thing. So again, just to recap, an accessory thing ordinarily has no independent identity while it is um, attached to the principal thing to form the composite thing. It's physically attached to the principal thing. Whereas auxiliary things um, are ordinarily, they exist separately and independently from the principal thing um, before the composite thing was, was formed. And also after the composite, usually also after the composite thing has been formed, it loses its independence due because of economic value location or use in the composite thing. So in other words, the auxiliary thing really just forms a economic unit with the composite thing. It doesn't necessarily attach to the composite thing. That's not a general rule. And you can have a look at the case of Cynical versus Root that um, describes the, the definition of um, auxiliary things. And in the case, also the court had to, to, to determine whether or not something was an auxiliary thing um, or uh, versus being an accessory thing. The case, the original case is in Afrikaans, but we did create a or draft a uh, translation um, into English, so it is accessible to everyone. So when it comes to auxiliary things then, as indicated in the slide, auxiliary things exist separate and independently from the principal thing as a general rule. Um, they, they only lose their independence because of their being seen as part of an economic unit with the principal and the um, accessory thing. So it's an economic unit. Um, but if it is removed from um, the composite thing, there will, no, there will not be any physical damage caused to the composite thing, because as we've said, it's ordinarily not physically part of the composite thing. Now, a good example of this, um, where you can see the various parts that, that, that we've just discussed um, of a composite thing is the, the bicycle with the, um, the uh, uh, helmet. So if you look at the thing that is in front of you, the bicycle, one could argue that the body of the um, bicycle is the principal thing based on the Kahn definition, because Kahn said that the, um, if you look at the thing, the thing that gives it its identity, that is the principal thing and the body of the bike bicycle really gives it its identity. If you then zoom into the wheels, you can argue that that potentially constitutes the uh, an accessory thing. Um, because it's physically attached to the bike or the bicycle and it, lo it lost its independent existence when it was physically attached because now it forms part of the, 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 the composite thing that is the bicycle. Then if you move over then to the helmet, the helmet isn't physically attached to the bicycle, but it forms an economic unit with the bicycle and therefore we argue that it is an auxiliary thing. Um, that only lose its in, loses it, its independence in because it, it forms part of this um, economic unit with a bicycle. Um, it's a combo deal, basically. Things can also be classified according to its nature based on whether or not it's divisible or indivisible. What do we mean with something being divisible versus something being indivisible? Divisible things can be divided or separated 
into parts without changing the nature, function or value of the thing. The nature and function and value of a divisible thing remains the same in total if it is divided. So its, constitu its cons constitutive parts will equal the same in value um, if it would have been or if it is divided. The focus here, however, is on determining legal divisibility and not physical divisibility. And the important example here is the example of a mug that 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 one can um, that one uses. So, if the definition of divisibility is that it should be able to be separated in parts without changing its nature, its function, and its value, then if a mug is um, separated, so for instance, if you break it. Um, then it immediately loses value. So the, the value of perhaps the, the ear of the mug that broke off of the, the base and then the top part, um, if you look at them individually and you perhaps ascribe values to them, if you put that value together, it would still not, if any, if there's any value, it would still not constitute what the mug was worth. Um, also, if you look at its function, you can't use the mug anymore um, or the parts of it anymore in the way that you would have used them before. Um, so, therefore, we say then that 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 the mug in it in the form of pieces um, is then obviously something that wasn't divisible before it was broken into pieces. So, a mug, a whole mug, you would also then say isn't divisible. Um, An example, however, of something that is divisible is um, wine, because you can pour wine out into glasses and um, the value of all of the glasses of wine that you've poured together would um, ordinarily or generally remain the same as that of the bottle of wine that, you, that, that it was poured out of. So its function still remains, the wine's function still remains the same after you've poured it out um, and its nature remains the same as well. So wine is a good example of something that is indeed divisible because it can be separated into um, parts without changing its function, value or its nature. Okay, so what then is divisible things, that um, indivisible things? So indivisible things then refer to the opposite. Um, Indivisible things cannot be divided into parts without changing the nature, function, or value of them. Um, and the nature and function value of an indivisible thing changes or decreases in total if it is divided. And I've already indicated the um, the example that is applicable here, um, which is the mug. All right. Um, if the mug is broken into parts, um, physically divided, it is you can say it is potentially physically divided, but it was not legally divided. And that's why I also then have um, the point on the slide about legal divisibility. When we speak about divisibility, um, we talk about legal divisibility. And the test for legal divisibility is if its constitutive parts um, are still have the same function, value, and nature. And if you're irrespective of whether or not it can be physically divided, and if your answer is no, the thing will be indivisible. But if your answer is yes, the thing will be regarded as being divisible. Things can then further be classified according to their nature. Uh, based on whether or not the thing is consumable versus it being non-consumable. So what is the test or how do we determine then when something is consumable versus when it is non-consumable? In other words, what is the definition of consumable and non-consumable? So consumable things are really things that are destined to be consumed um, or destined to be used until it is no more. Um, perhaps more detail to that description would be or would include things are consumable when they are usually destroyed as a result of being used in accordance with a normal destiny. 
And in this regard, we have fruit, for instance. Um, fruit are destined, or food in general, are destined to be consumed. And if they are used according to their destiny, in other words, um, eaten, and they are no more, then it means that they are actually consumable things. Non-consumables, on the other hand, refers to things that remains the same in essence or remain substantially the same even when used. And an example of this is perhaps a house or um, a ring that you wear um, or your watch. But talking about these type of things, and when we think about, you know, using them, they're not destined to be um, used up um, that until they are no more. But there are, um, there is something about using these type of objects like houses, cars, rings, um, that isn't necessarily altogether um, non-consumable, or that doesn't, that doesn't, that tells us that they aren't necessarily altogether non-consumable. Because what, what, what about when you use your car or you use your house and um, they are wear and tear? Does that change the fact that the house or the car or the ring is a consumable or not? So there's a specific test that we apply to determine um, if things that decrease in value after they are used um, constitute consumable th a consumable thing or if they stay a non-consumable thing, um, such as when you use a car. The test here is to determine whether or not the value exceeds the normal wear or tear. If the value exceeds the decrease in value after it has been used over maybe over a period of time, if the decrease in value exceeds normal wear and tear, then the thing classifies as a consumable. However, if the decrease in value is equal to or less than the normal wear and tear, then the thing is, uh, remains classified as a non-consumable. So I think then perhaps what one can uh, uh, infer from this is that it depends also on then how these things are used. Um, if someone uses something with care and takes good care of it, um, the normal wear and tear or the wear and tear that would accompany the thing would perhaps not exceed what can be expected as normal wear and tear. So something, uh, is, 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 the thing would then remain uh, non-consumable. But if um, the user of the thing did not perhaps use it with care, um, then that thing would potentially or um, likely be classified as a consumable thing. So this test first has to be um, applied to determine whether or not something qualifies as a consumable versus a non-consumable thing. Things can also be classified according to their nature based on whether or not um, a thing is fungible <coughs> or non-fungible. So fungible versus non-fungible. So what do we then mean with this term fungible? Um, so fungible really is a synonym, synonym for replaceable, but there are some further nuances that um, we will just highlight quickly. So uh, fungible things are independent entities that are identical, therefore replaceable. They are distinguished from each other by reference to their weight, number or size. And examples of fungible things would be that, um, like a, a, a chocolate, bar, chocolate bars, um, a ton of bricks, a tin of coke, etc. Whereas non-fungible things refers to um, things that are independently determined. They are unique, has unique characteristics and value, and 
you cannot replace it with something that looks something else. So it's not something that can be replaced with something that looks similar to it. It's unique and um, has unique characteristics and value. So the question then here is, um, is it possible to exchange non-fungible things? It's usually not possible to exchange non-fungible things since they are unique um, and it's usually be pro usually prohibited by law. Um, and I think an, to illustrate this, let's have a look at an example. So a painting of a famous painter that is very unique and that has specific um, characteristics. Um, and has a specific value like a painting by Van Gogh um, would not be exchangeable um, for a similar one that, that, that someone could recreate and, and, and um, replace it with. Why? Because it's prohibited by law. So fungible thing, non-fungible things are ordinarily not exchangeable. So what about money? Is money an example of a fungible or non-fungible thing. In the case of commissioners of custom versus um, commissioners of custom and excise versus Bank of Lisbon, the court decided that money is fungible since it is replaceable with other money. Now some things are non-fungible by nature, while others become non-fungible over time or by way of agreement. An example would be a family Bible. So when the Bible was initially perhaps bought by um, your great, great, great grandmother, it was just a normal Bible. It could, it could, you know, it could easily be replaced by another one um, that was also made in this in the same time. But then it was passed on from your great, great, great grandmother to your great, great grandmother and so on and so on and up until it landed in your hands of your father and over time the bible acquired this uh, the nature or the character of being non-fungible because now the specific bible cannot be replaced so that's why we say that it can uh, things can over time become move from being fungible to non-fungible um, or even by way of agreement if parties agree um, or intend that something must be specific um, and it cannot be replaced then that would then be the, the, the consequence would be that the thing would be regarded as non-fungible.